Hello everyone, this is Jim Lucy, Editor-in-Chief for Electrical Wholesaling and Electrical Marketing with the March 8th edition of the Today's Electrical Economy podcast series sponsored by Champion Fiberglass. The company began producing epoxy fiberglass conduit fittings in 1988 and in 1989 developed the first conduit from epoxy resins that had flame resistance and low smoke characteristics. This met the most stringent codes and specifications. In today's broadcast, we'll explore some key weekly economic indicators that will give you a sense of where the electrical economy may be headed in the coming weeks and give you some some of the major pricing trends in electrical products and other construction materials. The five weekly indicators that we'll be discussing today are initial unemployment claims at the state level, rail freight car traffic, the Baker Hughes rig count, oil prices, and copper prices. Our thanks again to Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring the Today's Electrical Economy podcast series for 2021. We had a terrific response to the presentations last year, and we're delighted to be working with Champion Fiberglass to deliver them to you again in 2021. Let's first look at the unemployment claims at the state level. The weekly unemployment data from the U.S. Department of Labor and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics highlights the states with the most unemployment claims. This data is valuable to electrical distributors, manufacturers, and reps because it offers empirical evidence of just how big an issue layoffs still are and now at the state at the local level. On a more positive note, when these claims start declining and establish a trend in this direction, it may be a clue for you about when the economy in that state is starting to improve. For the week ending February 27th, the advanced figure for seasonally adjusted unemployment claims were 748,078. That's an increase of 31,519. The unemployment rate in February on a national basis was little changed at 6.2%. The states with the biggest change in unemployment claims were Texas with a a change of 17,769, Ohio with an increase of 17,422, New York with a change of 11,508, Mississippi, with a change of 7,949, and Illinois, with a change of 5,768. Other states in the top 10, when measured by the change in the number of claims week to week were West Virginia, Virginia, Arkansas, Nevada, and Indiana. One of the more interesting leading indicators for the overall U.S. economy is freight rail traffic because it's a measure of the amount of raw materials and finished goods being shipped by rail. The best source for this data is the American Association of Railroads, or AAR, which publishes this data weekly at www.aar.org. Harsh weather conditions that we saw across the nation over the past couple weeks has done a number on freight rail traffic, so this data is skewed. The data is actually much better when you take a step back. According to AAR Senior Vice President John Gray, during February, snow and ice covered wide swaths of the country, including many areas that rarely see harsh winter weather, and this wreaked havoc on all forms of transportation, including rail. In fact, the total U.S. car loads in the third week of February were the lowest for any week in AAR's records going going back to 1988. While car car loads rebounded during the last week to a more typical level, February ended with noticeably lower total volumes. On the positive side, both intermodal and grain traffic remain relatively strong through three of, of the four weeks of the month. Because of this adverse weather conditions, the individual freight categories are down in most of the recent report too, with only grain and intermodal units showing any sizable increase for the year-to-date annual comparisons. Grain was up almost 28% year-over-year, and total intermodal units were up 7% for this time period. When tracked on this basis, total traffic, which includes the individual carloads of these commodities and the containerized units in the intermodal data, was up just 0.6%. If you track the oil market at all, you're probably familiar with the Baker Hughes rig count, which tracks the oil and gas rigs that are operating. This data is available for free by state, basin, and national basis at www.rigcount.bakerhughes.com. This slide gives you an idea of the largest oil and gas deposit. It really gives you a good sense of just how many of these large oil plays are in Texas and Oklahoma, and how big an area the Marcellus gas region covers in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and parts of West Virginia. The recent increases in oil prices have not yet had any big increase on the Baker Hughes rig count. The U.S. total rig count is down 390 rigs over the past year, with the biggest decline coming in the Permian Basin in West Texas, which has lost 204 rigs year over year through this time period. The total rig count and the rig count in the nation's largest oil basin in the Permian are both down 49% year over year. 
Despite the soft rig count numbers, the price of the benchmark West Texas Intermediate Oil is up 29% year over year and is tracking above the $60 per barrel mark that usually points toward profitability for drilling operations. That's just a rule of thumb as the price it takes for drillers to make money varies region to region. Economists like to call copper pricing Dr. Copper because it's the leading indicator for future economic activities since it's used in so many industries. The construction industry is among the leading markets for, of it for its use in wire and cable and copper plumbing pipe. This slide from John Gross's Copper Journal illustrates the relationship between spot copper prices and global inventory. The black line for pricing is tracked by the left axis. The blue shaded area represents the inventory levels in the LME or London Metal Exchange and in Shanghai. While in one way it's a rather classic relationship in that the price of copper rises as the inventory becomes depleted. However, getting accurate data on the amount of copper stored in the Shanghai warehouses for use in China, the world's copper market, has historically been very difficult. Other factors that complicate the accurate forecast for future demand in the copper market is the impact of di or disruptions in copper mines, particularly in South America, and the stock market speculation in copper markets. If you ever need more direct and regular insight to copper pricing trends, consider subscribing to John Gross's The Copper Journal at www.copperjournal.com. Always remember li listening to an economist from IHS Market, uh, John Mothershalls, who always called, who was expected to forecast copper pricings, and he jokingly would say that doing that was the bane of his, his existence because of the, all these changes that we've just discussed here. Any increase in copper prices have a direct and immediate impact on the price of wire and cable. As you can see in this chart from Electrical Marketing Newsletter's Electrical Price Index, power cable is up 10.6% year over year through January. The copper market is not, isn't the only place in the electrical market where we've seen these double-digit price increases. According to our Electrical Price Index, pole line hardware, boxes, and conduit fittings are all up over 10%. Non-metallic conduit has an increase of 8.5%, and it's also showing fast movement to the upside. These price increases are certainly a reflection of both some inflationary uh, price pressures as well as growing demand for these products. If you need to track the price of electrical products on a monthly basis, you can get that information as part of a $99 annual subscription to Electrical Marketing Newsletter. Contact me at jlucy at endeavorb2b.com for more information on subscribing. As big of an impact the increases in copper and steel pricing have had on the electrical market, price increases in the housing market are even more dramatic. According to data from www.randomlengths.com in its Random Framing Lumber Composite and the National Association of Home Builders, lumber prices have skyrocketed more than 180% since last spring. NAHB says this price increase has caused the price of an average new single-family home to increase by more than $24,000 since last April. Another way to track price increases of key building commodities is through scrap prices. The increases in iron and steel-based scrap and copper-based scrap both are showing dramatic increases year over year through January 1st of this year. According to data compiled from the Producer Price Index for Construction Materials by the St. Louis Federal Reserve Board, iron and scrap, steel scrap is up 51% year over year and copper scrap is up 29% year over year. The price of scrap is considered to be a good indicator of the overall health of the economy by many notable economists. Alan Greenspan, the former Federal Reserve Chair, used to track steel scrap prices quite regularly to judge the health of the economy. I found that Tamara Lundgren, the CEO of Schnitzer Steel, a scrap producer, said in an article published by CEO Magazine that scrap metals typically comes from vehicles, buildings, and appliances in a manufacturing activity, and it's the raw material used in the production of two-thirds of the steel produced in the United States, and almost 50% of the steel produced globally, excluding China. She says that scrap prices are usually a direct indicator of industrial production and consumer confidence that's not clouded by larger-scale commodity trading. This concludes our presentation for today. A special thanks to the folks from Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring the Today's Electrical Economy podcast series in 2021. Please contact me if there's any other type of economic data that you would like for us to cover in these podcasts, or if you would like to subscribe to Electrical Marketing Newsletter to get access to that electrical price data we discussed today. Our next presentation will be on Monday, March 22nd. Take care and be well.